Okay, so uh, this is actually joint work with uh, some of my students. I, I've listed up there. And, um, you know, feel free, free to ask uh, questions as I, as I go through the talk. <coughs> um, so there's been a lot of emphasis, both at this workshop and uh, more generally, on the use of, you know, large clusters uh, and, you know, tools such as MapReduce to deal with large data. Um, and I think there's been a little bit less emphasis on deciding when is it really appropriate to use these large, large clusters. And certainly in some cases it is, but uh, some cases it's not. And what can be done on uh, something that's a little bit smaller. And so something that's smaller might be uh, a laptop, or it might be a, uh, a desktop, or it might be a server. So nowadays you can go off, and in fact you can go on the web right now and go to the Dell site and you can buy a server uh, with uh, 64 cores on it uh, and uh, 2 uh, terabytes of memory uh, and uh, 20 terabytes of disk or more. In fact, probably the disk is pretty much unlimited. Um, you know, for about, I don't know, fifteen, twenty thousand dollars $20,000. Okay, so that's not a lot of money for a reasonably powerful machine. Uh, so how far can those go? And I think that's an interesting question. Uh, what are the potential advantages of using these machines? Well, one is just uh, cost. Uh, uh, another one is that they tend to be much more energy efficient on a per cycle basis. So if we look at some computation you want to do in a big server versus a little machine, you're probably going to be using much less energy for the same computation. Uh, more cost effective. Um, and another key point is that they're typically much easier to program. Okay, they typically have a shared memory model, and I'll be talking about this today. And they, uh, in particular, they're much easier for a more general class. So you don't have to restrict yourself to things that only map to MapReduce, or only map to Prego, or only map to some restricted class of model. They're, very, they're really general purpose machines. You can mix you know, your string processing with your divide and conquer, with your, you know, all sorts of different flavors. And they all fit together nicely. And there's well-known parallel algorithms, et cetera. They're also easier to administer and more reliable. One of these servers, uh, once you uh, boot it, they typically stay up for uh, years on end. They are very, very, very rarely crash. <coughs> so there's not really a question of even needing to deal. The fault tolerance is done in the hardware. The, the memory is fault tolerant. And there's all sorts of fault tolerance built in. <coughs> um, so but why, do, why might we use a large cluster? Well, often the reason cited, uh, the data just doesn't fit in the memory of uh, you know, a single machine of some flavor. Uh, and the other is just uh, processing speed. Okay, so let's sort of address some of these. Uh, and if you go look at a lot of the articles about big data and you know where the big data comes from, and there's been all sorts of articles, or you can even go to the Wikipedia page, and uh, they'll list all sorts of sorts of sources of very big data. Uh, often, the, almost the top of the list always is things like this Sloan Sky Survey that's generating some huge amounts of data. Uh, the large Hadron Collider with all sorts of sensors generating data at you know, uh, very high rates. Uh, there's Walmart, which is the biggest you know, retailer in the world. And, they have, and they've been for many, many years collecting every minuscule piece of data they possibly can. Uh, it's uh, very detailed. Uh, of course, then there's just YouTube. There's a lot of videos on YouTube. And you can sort of look at the frame, average bytes per frame, and calculate how many total bytes there's on YouTube. Uh, and then you could imagine, and we don't have this yet, but you can imagine someday we have uh, the human genome sequence for every human. Okay. Uh, I don't know if I want them to have mine, but <coughs> uh, if they did, you know, that's a relatively large amount of data. So these are all uh, relatively large sets of data. But then you have to ask yourself, well, you know, how much of that's really relevant? So it turns out the Slo Sloan uh, Sky Survey, they throw away 99.9% .9 of that data that's coming in. Okay, it's, uh, uh, it's very rough. In the Large Hadron Collider, it turns out most of those centers, only a tiny, tiny fraction of them, are non-zero at any time. So just the most trivial form of, so when they calculate these things, they sort of just multiply the number of sensors by the, uh, uh, you know, uh, rate of those sensors, and that gives you a number, right? But yeah, that's not the real question is, you know, how much useful information is it in there? In Walmart, uh, well, probably if you're going to be doing some sort of statistical analysis of Walmart, like I said, this data of Walmart collects every single little thing about not just sales receipts. It, it, it collects, I don't know, the temperature of their stores at any given time. You know, they got sensors on all their different refrigerators and all sorts of different things. Uh, you're probably going to be looking at some slice of it. And maybe that slice is big or maybe it's not. 
So I'm not going to claim that this is always going to fit in some smaller memory. But you have to be aware that that's sort of a upper bound as if you looked at everything that Walmart ever touched. Uh, YouTube, well, probably you're not going to just bring in all the YouTube videos and process them. Or maybe there might be a couple people who want to do that. More likely is you're going to extract features from those uh, 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 videos and then you know, do some analysis of those feature vectors. Uh, and so, so feature vectors would be very much smaller than, than, than you know, the total size of the video. And the genome, uh, well, first of all, a lot of that's repeats. 99% of our, some huge percent of our genomes are repeated. Uh, and uh, not only that, but there's all sorts of smart compression you could do. So it's not actually clear how much information there really is in the human genome. You can't just multiply the number of people by the size. Uh, that would be a very uh, silly way to store it. <coughs> um, but let's look at some particular types of uh, <coughs> uh, uh, data. So let's look at web graphs and look at how big uh, web graphs are and you know, where we could fit them nowadays. Uh, so there's all, uh, all I should say graphs in general. This is just an example of a graph. So there's been a lot of uh, you know, emphasis on large graphs. So we can go out there and say, well, how big are the graphs which are available uh, nowadays? Well, first thing to note is for us poor uh, people in academia, it turns out we can't get a hold on very big graphs. At least I can't. And the first request I have is if any of you have bigger graphs I can get a hold of, I would be delighted to get, get them. Okay, so the biggest graph I've been able to get a hold of are around uh, six billion edges. So there's a Yahoo sample graph. There's also a UK. Uh, web graph, they're both about the same size. The UK is five and a half billion edges, the Yahoo is a little bit over six billion edges. <coughs> and, uh, you know, that's, that's what we can get in academia. Uh, I've been told that there's much bigger graphs in, you know, in industry. There's a Twitter graph, I believe that's a, the follower graph, which this is the number I got last spring, maybe it's a bit bigger now. Uh, there's a Facebook uh, sort of friends graph, and these are, these are just numbers that I've been whispered to because they're all proprietary in information. So not only can I not get the graphs, I can't even get the size of them. Uh, and then you can sort of look at there's a lot of junk on the web. If you throw away uh, the complete junk, uh, you can get various estimates, and it's you know on the order of 200 billion. And uh, uh, so that's the size. And then if you look at how big it would be to comp uh, store those, at least if you're just storing the graph structure itself, the vertices and the edges. Uh, then that's about the number of bytes you need. And in fact, today I'll talk a little bit about graph compression, if I get to it. And you can actually get about a factor of 10 improvement in size by using some relatively simple graph compression techniques. So if you compress those, those, those are sort of the sizes of graphs. Okay? And those are the biggest graphs. I can get a hold of it actually on the relatively small size. Uh, some of you probably have access to some of these bigger ones. <coughs> um, you can also look at text. And there's various sources of text. You can go to JSTOR, which is, as most of you know, a collection of journal articles, a very broad collection. This is the one that was involved in that controversy at MIT where the, the poor student got uh, sent to jail, or was about to be sent to jail for taking some of them. Uh, there's PubMed, uh, which is, uh, it's got more documents, but each one's smaller. It's about the same amount of si same size. And then there's a Library of Congress. And you can just count the number of uh, volumes and take an average of uh, uh, the number of uh, characters per volume. And uh, then you can assume you can compress it. And that's about the size. So that's about the limit of text, OK, on, on the order of a, a terabyte. <coughs> OK, well, now let's look at what's available on different machines. OK, so we've got various flavors of machines. We have laptops. I got the price there. Uh, I'm assuming for the main memory that you pretty much loaded it, okay? Now, some of these machines take a little bit more than that memory, uh, but you take a laptop and you, you fill it with memory, you can get 10 gigabytes. Uh, uh, nowadays, you can put a bit more than that. You can get a desktop, you can put 100, and I think most of them sort of limit at 128 gigabytes. Uh, or you can get one of these servers. Uh, these are typically rack-mounted servers, you know, about this big. <coughs> And uh, they go up to, in fact, some of them go up to two terabytes nowadays. And probably if you ask the company, they, they would do you a favor and put a little bit more than that in. Uh, so this is a physical memory. And then you can look at the uh, uh, secondary memory, which is the disks. And then that's about two orders uh, uh, larger in magnitude. 
And these actually, the disks are pretty much unlimited. You could put a lot more, but at some point, the, uh, there's only so much information you can get on and off of it, so it doesn't really pay off. And then the uh, number of cores, and that's the number of processing units these typically have. <coughs> uh, so if we took look something like the Twitter graph and uh, map that on, like I say, that's a lot bigger than I can get a hold of. Uh, it's, uh, you know, it fits on everything in yellow there. It's, it, it's, it fits, right? So it uh, fits on a server. It doesn't quite fit on a desktop into the memory of the server, okay? And, uh, uh, you know, because I can get this terabyte, so you can get in there. Now, like I say, this is just a graph. You might have some auxiliary information. So depending on what you're doing with it, uh, you know, it maybe doesn't fit. But a lot of the things we've been talking about in the last couple of days, like, uh, I don't know, triangle counting, all you really need is a graph structure. You're not keeping anything, ar uh, anything around. Or even page rank. And a lot of these graph analysis or between the centrality, typically all you need is the graph structure and maybe a little bit of data per vertex. So in between the centrality, you have to keep like a floating point number on each uh, vertex. <coughs> so there's not that much more uh, the auxiliary data. Uh, <coughs> So this is, uh, so the claim is, and if we compress it, uh, we could even squeeze it onto a, a desktop, okay, because we can get another factor of 10, and once again, you'd have to look at what auxiliary data you're keeping and whether you can compress the auxiliary data as well to really figure this out, but at least uh, as a, you know, sort of first cut. So the point is that we can fit pretty big graphs, certainly on a, uh, you know, a $20,000 rack-mounted uh, server, with 64 cores. So then the question is, well, what can we do? You know, what's the performance compared to, uh, you know, your favorite, uh, you know, graph processing uh, library on such a server? And that's one of the things uh, I'll talk about today. <coughs> so in particular, what I'm going to uh, talk about in the rest of the uh, talk here is I'm going to talk first about a little bit about what sorts of generality. So the claim is these shared memory servers, you can much more flexible in the, the, type, the sorts of programs you can put on them. You're not limited to just that something that fits onto MapReduce, something that fits onto Prego, something that, you know, whatever your favorite library is. They're really general purpose uh, machines. There's been a lot of experience on, on uh, uh, developing parallel algorithms with these. Uh, there's parallel algorithms with just about anything you can think of uh, on these sorts of machines. <coughs> I'll talk about a particular graph processing thing that we've mapped onto shared memory machines and compare them to other graph processing uh, libraries. I'll talk about this is another extreme. Is what about if you're talking about really, if you really want to run your Twitter graph on a laptop, you'd have to go to disk. And so uh, uh, one of my students uh, has uh, developed a system that uh, works, uh, can process very large graphs on a, uh, a laptop. And we'll look at sort of the performance characteristics of that. And if I get to it, I'll talk a little bit about the graph compression and how you can get basically a factor of 10 if you, without that complicated methods, compression on a graph, so you could put, put much larger graphs on, on smaller memories. <coughs> um, so the first topic was the, uh, you know, what can you program on these uh, machines? And so I'm assuming now one of these servers, it's a shared memory server, they typically have up to 64 processes on maybe four chips or eight chips. Every year if you scale, uh, nowadays you can get the Xeon Phi, you can actually get 80 uh, cores on, on one chip. And, you know, so soon we're going to have, you know, they're going to have a few hundred cores in a shared memory uh, system. Um, the nice thing about these shared memories is it's very easy to write the general purpose. You, they allow you to do nested parallelism, and I'll talk about that a little bit, pipeline parallelism. They do allow you to build all sorts of very complicated pointer structures. You're not just limited to graphs. You can have trees. You can have trees with graphs. You can have graphs that have subtrees. You can have hypergraphs. You know, anything you can possibly think of as a pointer structure. So, and you don't need to, a separate library for each one of these things. You know, tree library, a graph library, whatever. <coughs> um, there's lots of understanding. There's been 30 years of development of uh, pa parallel algorithms, 40 years for uh, these sorts of shared memory machines. So there's algorithms for just about anything you can think of out there. And uh, we've done a lot of experiments. They're actually quite reasonably fast. I'll talk about some of them. They have simple cost models, and programming is relatively easy. So here's just an example of a parallel program that you might write, write uh, that maps very easily onto a shared memory machine. Uh, so this is quicksort. You might have been taught it as a sequential program, but it's really uh, a parallel piece of code, a parallel algorithm. <coughs> so what does it do? Um, 
And this is an example of what I call nested parallelism. So it's a way that basically I can take a, something that's parallel and then make multiple calls to other things which are parallel. Okay, so quick sort here. It uh, says if the size is less than or equal to 1, I just return the result. Otherwise, I pick a random pivot, and I pick the elements which are less than the pivot, equal to the pivot, and greater. I recursively solve the ones which are less and greater, and then I put the results together. Okay, so this is all your understanding. This is actually in a real parallel language uh, called Nessel. Uh, and then you ask, well, how much parallelism is there? Well, there's a lot of parallelism in this, a huge amount of parallelism, because when you compare the keys to the pivots, that can all be done in parallel. So you can basically subselect all the ones less, equal, and greater in a very uh, highly parallel way. And then there's a very quite different kind of parallelism, which is some people would call task parallelism, is I can make the two recursive calls to quicksort in parallel. And of course, that forks off. You get a whole tree of recursive calls, which eventually which get done in parallel. So there's a lot of parallelism. The subselection of the elements equal, greater, and less, that sort of, it's sort of a data parallel that can be done very easily in MapReduce. You could have a MapReduce that basically collects up the ones which are less, equal, and greater. That's pretty straightforward. The other kind, that's task parallelism, that can't be done in, in, in any of the, most of these libraries, you know, MapReduce, Pig, or, you, know, you name it, this is, uh, it can't be done in the, these sorts of libraries. <coughs> um, but this is a very simple piece of code. You can code it up, and it actually runs reasonably efficiently in parallel. We uh, code this up. You get something that's uh, basically within a factor of two of the very fastest parallel algorithm that's, that's out, out there, which is a, a, a sample-based sort. <coughs> Uh, it also can be analyzed. This is supposed to sort of show the DAG of the computation. So the left hand is when you split it into, uh, so it sort of shows time along the x-axis here and the amount of parallel work along the y-axis. So you can subselect the elements less than the pivot on the very uh, uh, top in, in parallel. You make the two recursive calls. They can also, they run in parallel. In addition, within each of them, there's parallelism. So that's why this is called nested parallelism. And this works its way on. And so if you look at the so-called span or the critical pass or the depth of the computation, it's, it's you know, polylogarithmic. It's something like log squared n. It's, so the tree is log n deep, and each of those blocks is log n in order to do the packing down. And the total amount of work is, uh, is n log n. And it turns out you can also analyze uh, this, the cache uh, com complexity of this algorithm, uh, as discussed in one of the talks yesterday. And uh, this turns out to be an, an optimal measure and cap. So these are all with, uh, since it's quicksort with random pivots, these are all with high probability bounds. The point is you can analyze it, you can code it, the code is short, you can run it, and it runs uh, efficiently. And it's, you know, uh, it's not the sort of thing that you can do with MapReduce. <coughs> um, and you might say, well, quicksort, who cares about quicksort? But it's, you know, this sort of recursive divide and conquer is also applicable in a lot of uh, machine learning types of uh, algorithms. So here's just a classification tree. I'm trying to build a decision tree. Uh, uh, and uh, typically what you do <coughs> is you would, uh, you know, you, you take in your, if you've got a set of attribute value vectors, one of which you're conditioning on. So you're trying to uh, classify based on one of these. And in this case, it's, it happens to be the last element of that vector. You basically figure out which of the other uh, attributes give you the most uh, correlated most highly with that, that attribute. You split on that, uh, and then you recurse on the subsets. Because now you've split on that one attribute. You've created a bunch of buckets. Now for each of those buckets, you want to decide what's the next most important uh, attribute. Okay? And this actually has a very similar structure to the quicksort. It's a divide and conquer algorithm. You can do this conditional entropy thing in parallel. And like I said, that sort, of, that sort of thing would be very easy to do in MapReduce. Uh, but then when you make the recursive calls, you've got multiple calls to uh, the same algorithm cut here on those uh, subsets, which could be highly different sizes. And so you can't just split one on each processor. That, uh, <coughs> oops. Um, and then, uh, you know, so you want to basically do that in parallel. And again, this is very straightforward on a, uh, on a shared memory machine. <coughs> uh, and there's also, so they were just talking about the structure of the computation. And then you also want to build various da data structures. I thought I'd take cover trees out. Uh, I'm not sure if John's in the audience here, but 
Uh, it's a basically a tree that's used to do sort of nearest no neighbor searches in metric spaces. Uh, it doesn't require an embedding in a Cartesian space. You can basically uh, uh, build these trees, and then you can do searches on it. The point being, first of all, you can build the tree very easily. Uh, in fact, the algorithm to do this in parallel is it's almost trivial in, in, on a shared memory machine. Uh, but you can also then represent this complicated data structure, and you can search it. Uh, and these sorts of things are not natural. And I know MapReduce is sort of you just process a bunch of data and then throw it away. You don't know, build data structures and process those data structures. <coughs> Uh, or suffix tree is another thing that we've looked at. It's a, you know, it's a, for, it's a method for storing uh, long strings so that you can very quickly do all sorts of queries, like do searches on them, find uh, 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 common subsequences, et cetera. Uh, and uh, it's a relatively complicated, sophisticated algorithm, uh, especially the parallel version. Uh, and it's got all sorts of divide and conquer in it. It's got all sorts of components. Uh, again, it's not that complicated to do on a shared memory machine, and you can get uh, you know, a reasonably good speed up on these sorts of machines. <clears throat> okay, so that, that's just to argue that you know, these, in some sense, they're more general purpose, that you don't, you don't have to then restrict yourself to your, your X library in order to do this. You've got a general purpose programming model. <clears throat> um, the next thing I was going to do is talk about a particular graph uh, analysis tool. So we wanted to see what sort of performance you could get uh, on and flexibility you could get in uh, on a shared memory machine. So we developed uh, uh, with a student, uh, Julian, this uh, LIGER thing. So let me just talk a little bit about that. <coughs> so it stands for Lightweight Graph Processing System. Lightweight here just means it's uh, <coughs> not very many lines of code. It's 1,500 lines of code. And an important aspect of this is that it's very easy to mix with uh, any other. It's a C++ based uh, thing. It's not like a special purpose language. You can throw in your suffix tree code and link it in with it and you know, take the graph and output it in. You know, it's all in the same environment. Uh, so that's all nice and convenient. Uh, it's a simple framework, two routines, and one data structure. I'll describe these, uh, uh, parallel describe. Uh, <coughs> And the point is that we, you know, it, it's efficient. It outperforms most of these graph libraries like uh, Pregol, et cetera. In particular, it outperforms them using just a 40 core server not needing compared to, you know, uh, hundreds of cores on, on these other systems. Uh, and I'll give you some numbers. <coughs> uh, it's, the interface is it's also more flexible in the sense that it allows you uh, something like Prego allows you to turn uh, vertices off and on. It's a, 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 most of you might know Prego, it's a graph representation tool. It allows you to turn vertices off and on. Here we allow basically arbitrary uh, a vertex, we have a concept of a vertex subset. And you could have multiple them around, you could have vertex A, B, and C in one set. And the vertex subset is it, separate from the graph. So you have your graph data and then a vertex su a subset that's completely separate for it. It's not like in Prego, where it's part of the graph is a little bit of state that says whether, whether a vertex is on or off. Uh, so this allows you to have an arbitrary number of them, and, and it gives you a nice sort of modularity because you don't have to mess up your graph representation. Uh, you can also have multiple graphs around. You might have, so a common thing we found is you might have the same set of vertices, but in some cases you've got red edges, and in some cases you've got blue edges. And sometimes you want to process the red edges and sometimes the blue. So you just have two graphs around with the same vertices. And you've got the red and the blue. And you can have any mixture of these. And you can use the same vertex subset for those two graphs, et cetera. So it's, you know, it, it's just because it's a shared memory. You can, any of these things are just perfectly natural. <coughs> um, then the two routines are basically vertex map. So this just maps some function over the vertices. OK, it doesn't map the function over the output edges. So unlike a, a a graph lab or Prego, which when you say vertex map, you mean typically mean do something with the output edges. Because there's a separate uh, edge map which then maps all all the edges. So you can say something uh, map all, all over the edges. And, and, and an advantage of this edge map is that it can be in parallel. So for example, if you had a graph which had very high degree, in particular you could have a vertex that connects to every other vertex. Okay, most of these other systems you'd have to process the edges out of that vertex sequentially, uh, and so it's not you sort of bounded by the, the highest degree as amount of parallelism you can get. Here, the actual processing over the edges is it, itself parallel. <coughs> uh, 
So I'd give uh, just a quick uh, example of how you might apply this to breadth first search. In fact, we, the original motivation for this is the Graph 500 benchmark, which is a, a graph benchmark developed within the supercomputing community. Uh, and we were trying to get the, there's a very highly tuned one for these shared memory machines, and we were trying to get the sort of same performance with very simple code. Anyway, so breadth first search, you start at some source, you basically search out to all their neighbors, uh, you find everyone that's one away, okay, and then from there, so uh, we go and find everyone that's, uh, we mark them all. Uh, we then look at all the out edges. Some of them will have already been visited, so some of them might point back to R. I guess in this graph they don't, but uh, some might point within. Uh, all the ones that haven't been visited, you go add to the next so-called frontier. What's important here is each frontier is a so-called vertex uh, a subset, right? It's a subset of all the vertices. So in our model, this would just be we'd have some representation for that subset of vertices. We would then map over the, the out edges of those vertices to get uh, uh, the next set and uh, uh, add them to the next frontier. Um, okay, so that just continues <coughs> until you've uh, explored all the graph. Uh, the other nice point about this is you can actually, st in, in this model, you can store uh, some, some algorithms. What they do is they go one direction on these uh, breadth first searches, and then they have to basically go backwards. So the between the centrality algorithm does that. And so you just store the vertex subsets on a, a linked list, right, you, each one of them. And then when you go backwards, you just pull the first one out. You put them on a stack, basically, pull them out in reverse order. It's all it's, uh, you know, basic programming. <coughs> um, this is what the code would look like for that, that thing. Uh, it's in a C++ syntax, but other than that, it's pretty much what's shown here. Uh, all this says is uh, <coughs> this is the edge map. And what edge map does is it takes a graph, it takes the, a vertex subset, and it says map over all the out edges of that vertex subset. Uh, a particular function, in this case the function is this update, uh, which is going to grab the next uh, frontier. And uh, then it uh, uh, also takes a conditional that says you only uh, uh, apply this thing if this is conditional true. So in particular, you only apply if it hasn't already been visited. That's what that comes in there. And if it has, <laughs> Already, what you do is this compare and swap, which is an atomic operation, which basically updates this uh, parents array so that the, the, the actual goal of here, by the way, is to build a DFS tree. So each, each uh, node points to its parent in, this, uh, in the DFS. <coughs> so what that does, and it also returns a value here which says uh, uh, whether you want to keep it in the next vertex subset. So only if the compare and swap succeeds, you add it to the next uh, vertex subset. And that's uh, what's then finally returned here as frontier. Okay, so that's sort of what a code would look like. <coughs> Any questions? Okay. Um, the uh, <coughs> there's actually this is a thing is we were trying to compete with these uh, the, the graph 500 code, and it turns out there's this very cute technique that was developed actually here at Berkeley uh, by uh, a, a group. The student here is Beamer that uh, did a lot of the work. And it's a technique that basically says if the, the number of vertices is very small, then you want a sparse representation of those vertices. You want to basically only operate on, on the vertices in the frontier. Okay? If the number is relatively large, and the large being about, in practice is about 10% or more, you actually want to go the opposite direction. You basically want to look at all the vertices and read from the vertex subset, and then you use a sort of bit uh, uh, mask representation for the vertex subset. Okay, I'm not going to go in detail of this, but uh, it turns out that this is, uh, uh, gets you a lot of efficiency imp uh, improvements. And then with this, we basically compete with the very highly optimized code of, of Beamer and uh, Patterson, uh, which is quite uh, messy code. Um, <coughs> Let me just skip this. So uh, we, you know, we ran experiments on this. We, ran, we implemented a bunch of different algorithms. I'll, I'll list them in a second. Um, we uh, uh, used, run the experiment on the largest graph we could get hold of, which is about 6.6 .6 billion edges. This very easily fits in one of these. This is just a picture of what of these, one of these rack-mounted servers uh, look like. Okay, this in fact, we probably could have fit something 10 times as big <coughs> on this. Uh, and like I said, this is like a four-chip uh, system here with uh, this particular one has 40 cores. Um, <coughs> and uh, 
like said, this is just we imp it's implemented in uh, the parallelism comes from a library uh, called Silk Plus, which is actually now part of uh, the GNU uh, uh, release. If you go get, get the new G GNU G uh, C++ compiler, it has these parallel primitives uh, built in to it as of uh, just this month, I believe. Well, maybe it's coming out next week or something. Uh, we use this 40 core machine. Uh, we get uh, good speed ups on, on page rank. We actually get almost perfect uh, speed up. Uh, this is just a comparison on a few of the different algorithms we compared to some uh, other codes that we found out there. Uh, KDT is actually a system, I guess, was described yesterday, Knowledge Discovery Toolkit. Uh, Power Graph was also described. Pregol, many of you might know, is a system originally suggested at Google, and there's been various implementations. <coughs> uh, so uh, if you look at the like breadth-first search, uh, we, you know, we quite, you know, four, five times faster on, uh, you know, many fewer. So it's 40 cores instead of 240 cores. So again, if you're looking at cost effectiveness or uh, energy effectiveness, uh, you have to multiply the difference in number of cores by the difference in, in performance to get the overall cost advantage. <coughs> so it would be, I don't know, what a, a four times six or something. Uh, you know, between the centrality, uh, you can compare it. Uh, page rank, I should point out, everyone's done page rank, you know, you, you can find implementations. As discussed in the talk yesterday, page, uh, Power Graph just blows away all the previous ones. Okay, so if you look at Hadoop and uh, uh, et cetera, so the, the page rank for, for Power Graph is 3.6. In fact, now I think it's a little bit uh, better than that. <coughs> uh, and so it, 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 you know, blows away these other things. Uh, but we're basically competitive, okay? They, basically, the times here are about the same. Uh, the difference here is with this is 40 cores versus 240 cores. Mm -hmm. So, um, I'm sure this is a frustrating question. Weren't these large, weren't these systems designed to, to handle much larger graphs? So isn't it, um, in some sense, taking them out of their um, compute cost? Well, my get argument is I can't find a, yeah. Okay, if you can give me a graph that doesn't fit in, in, in our system, then that's true, okay. I, I just, I'd certain, I, I, the graphs, I can get a couple order of the magnitude, at least one order of magnitude from not being able to fit. Uh, the graphs in, in, that these other companies have are probably closer to that, that border, right? Uh, but like I said, these, these servers, you can, you can probably, you know, going to expand quite rapidly soon, right? So, <clears throat> um, my, the question is just, let's analyze. So, sure, they, I'm sure there are graphs that don't fit. Uh, but we should think about which graphs fit and which ones don't. <coughs> uh, <coughs> yeah, so, but uh, to, to take your highest level point, yes, maybe it's unfair to do a comparison here. But the, the, the issue here is do we need to go to these more general purpose? <coughs> um, I guess the shortest paths, uh, there's a, a, in the original Prego paper, and this might be unfair because that was the very first Prego paper, maybe they've optimized uh, 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 the systems a lot. Uh, since then, uh, but you know, it's again, this is on uh, 300 multi cores, so I think that's 1,200 cores total versus 40 cores and, and 10 times slower. <coughs> um, so, anyway, so it's lightweight, simple, uh, efficient, and like I said, a lot of the advantage here does come from the fact that we're doing it on shared memory. Okay, so as soon as you go to distributed memory, the overheads of, of, of transmitting. Uh, uh, messages across these things becomes much more uh, expensive. The, the flexibility you have becomes less. Uh, so then the, the question is really, what can we do on shared memory? <coughs> uh, some future work is what we're currently working on is, uh, in fact, it's not limiting to here, is, is uh, actually using the compressed representation of graphs so that we can store even bigger graphs. <coughs> um, okay, the other work that... Uh, uh, student Apo uh, Corolla worked on is this uh, question of, well, what could you do on a very small machine, like a laptop? You know, could we process very large graphs? How slow would it be? So in this case, we're not going to compete with the very fastest uh, systems out there, but I guess what this shows is that you can actually process, you know, relatively large graphs on a small machine, maybe not quite as fast on, on larger machines, but that's the result. Um, 
it's this work actually sort of uh, piggybacks. There's been a whole bunch of work on uh, sort of disk-based algorithms for, for graph processing. Uh, in the theory community, there's been a lot of work in, uh, elsewhere. Uh, this particular uh, system is basically, what it does is it's a, a vertex-based system. In fact, it's quite similar to graph lab. Uh, where you basically each vertex does something with its uh, set of neighbors on each iteration and uh, uh, updates the, uh, uh, the, the vertex based on its neighbors or updates the, actually the out edges based on the current value of out edges. Um, it turns out that this particular method only has to pass over the data once per, per iteration. Uh, it requires that the memory is about at least square root of n of the size of the total graph. Okay, and, and that's almost trivial, even if you think of very, very, very big graphs, square root of n should fit in the, in the memory. Uh, it breaks it up into uh, uh, shards. So these are the vertices. Uh, and the idea is that each shard is going to be loaded into uh, a memory. You process shards. The shards are uh, uh, basically sorted by in edges. So the way when you process a vertex, you're going to send uh, 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 some information on all the out edges which are going to be the input to in edges on another uh, shard, possibly. But because they, they're sorted by in edges, they're going to be adjacent in the other shard. So you can think of this as if we had it on disk, all of our axes are sequential axes. So I basically load this shard into memory, uh, and it's a bunch of sequential axes. And then uh, when I write out, I'm going to write out contiguously along each of those red blocks. So some of the out edges from this shard one are going to go to shard, well, going to go to itself. Some are going to go to shard two. Some are going to go to shard three. Uh, but when I write them out, they're going to be contiguous. So it means basically I do a single pass uh, uh, over the things. In fact, I basically do one write of each uh, block and then a read. Because when I write it out to shard two, I'm going to write it. And then when I process shot two, I'm going to I read that again. <coughs> uh -huh. And then you process the <coughs> next shard, and uh, it's going to uh, write contigu contiguous blocks within each of those. <coughs> um, so uh, they, we've done, uh, basically, Oppo wrote a whole bunch of different uh, applications on top of this. Uh, a lot of these, since he's also involved in the Graph Lab project, came from the Graph Lab project. Um, <coughs> and uh, there's, in order to create the shards, there's some amount of pre-processing time to, to break them up and sort them and everything. So it's, you know, it's not completely trivial. So the biggest graph, again, we have is this Yahoo web. You know, it takes half an hour just to pre-process this graph. But once it's pre-processed, then you can do these iterations in parallel. And so this is just on a, a, a Mac Mini. You know, that's one of these things, uh, you know, oops, with uh, eight gigabytes of RAM, uh, you know, a, a, a relatively small SSD, and a uh, Intel, this is a, a four-core machine. <coughs> um, if you look at the times here, you can compare them to uh, Graph Lab times. And like I said, for PageRank, Graph Lab and Allegra are about the same, okay? Uh, so this, this is not as fast. It's 40 times slower. Uh, but you're doing it on a, uh, a, a laptop, uh, you know, or, or, well, a Mac Mini, not a laptop, but basically equivalent to a laptop. Um, so, you know, these are the sorts of uh, times you can get. A triangle counting is, is about 30 times. It's uh, on Graph Lab is about 30 times faster than Graph Chai. So it's, it's this, this is, uh, the disk-based version is 30 times slower. But what it shows is that you could, if you were, I don't know, a student and all you had access to with a Mac Mini, uh, and you could put up with, uh, uh, with a little bit more time, uh, you could process these graphs on it. You know, this is a reasonable size graph uh, with uh, six billion edges. Um, there's also, uh, uh, you could imagine techniques that we've been looking at where you use a mix of disk-based algorithms, especially if you have auxiliary data that doesn't fit in, into your memory, but the main graph does, you can imagine storing the auxiliary data out of memory and only scanning it when you touch those vertices, if you touch them in order. Uh, and uh, you know you could get uh, some sort of a mix here. We haven't actually tried this as future work. <coughs> okay. <coughs> the uh, last topic 
I wanted to talk about is uh, in-memory compression. I think this is uh, an approach that could be used to lots of data structures. If you want to store a very large data in memory, uh, what we're looking at here is not just, you know, normally when you think of compression, you think of, I know, uh, uh, storing a image out to disk or something. And the point is, in order to uh, read that image, you have to fully un uncompress it. Okay, the goal here is to basically store data in memory in a compressed form such that you can get random access to it. Okay, so the goal is I want to say uh, access vertex 27 and uh, give me the list of its uh, uh, neighbors. Okay, and you don't want to basically have to decompress the whole graph to do that. You want to basically just do that as fast as uh, random access. In fact, the interesting thing here is we found that you can actually, it's a little bit faster if you do the compressed format because the memory footprint is less. So you're going to, as you, uh, for example, access your, your neighbor list uh, in this compressed format, you're going to hit less cache lines because it's, it's been compressed down to something uh, smaller. And the idea is uh, pretty simple. This is actually work uh, I did, you know, a student of mine did many years ago, ten, over 10 years ago, is that you renumber uh, vertices using so-called graph separators. So a graph separator is a partition of the graph where you're trying to find a partition into about half and half vertices. It doesn't have to be exactly half and half. So that's the number of edges you cut is relatively small. Okay, and it's well known that a lot of real world graphs have reasonably uh, 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 small uh, separators because you, know, you think of communities, let's say it's a web graph. You know, the CMU set of pages is pretty much self referential, it has some locality to it. So the number of edges that you cut if you separate the CMU graph uh, from the rest of the world is much less than you'd expect in a random graph. Okay, and that's when this, this technique works well. Uh, and so you renumber the vertices so they have this locality. So for example, we renumber all the CMU vertices so that they're, they're near each other, and then we difference encode the edges. Okay, so uh, uh, the idea is you take your graph, you find cuts, and you do actually do this recursively until you're that left with uh, uh, either a leaf or very small components. And then you just give an, an order numbering to the vertices. So I would you know, number these you know, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, et cetera, along that way. So now the idea is that vertices, which are near each other in the graph, which will be ending up in these components, will have numbers which are close to each other. Okay. And then what you do is you encode an edge by instead of saying this, this is a pointer form, I don't know, vertex 7,300, whatever it is, to some other random number, is you, you encode the difference. So if, this is, if, they, if these two vertices only differ by 7, they're very close to each other, then you encode that 7. And it turns out that there's lots of codes which you can use, uh, which use very few bits if the numbers are small. And uh, so this is just an example. I've renumbered this graph, so it has the locality, right? These 0, 1, 2, 3, so numbers which are close to each other, close to each other in the graph. We then write out the adjacency lists. So uh, this particular vertex 4 has four neighbors, which are 2, 3, 5, and 6. And we encode them by first we take the difference between the vertex 4 and the first one, which is negative 2. The first one is the only one that can be negative. And then we put them in increasing order, so the difference between for, uh, between 2 and 3 is 1, between 3 and 5 is 2, et cetera. Um, and so now what we have to do to encode my out list is just encode these numbers. And these numbers are small, and so I can use very sm a small number of bits in it. So the point is it's really just like an adjacency list. I just put them you know, in a cache line, one after each other, except I only need a few bits per edge here. And uh, I then just randomly access the vertex, and from that it turns out to be quite fast to decode these, these codes. It's a very uh, quick table lookup <clears throat> and doesn't involve any more cache misses. It's just a, a bit operations, basically. There's also a theory behind here that says that if, if the graph happens to have uh, good separators, in particular, if you can find a cut where uh, less than n, uh, uh, a polynomially less, so n to the you know, 0.7 or 0.8 or 0.9, edges are cut, uh, then the total number of bits you'll need for this representation is, is order n. Okay, for a random graph, you can prove you're always going to need n log n bits because every pointer takes about log n bits, and there's n of them, m of them. In this case, you uh, uh, you can reduce that. <clears throat> so 
to give you a sense of how it works in practice, how many bits you can get, these are, are the bit counts. Uh, I, oops. I wouldn't worry about the uh, uh, TD here. That's the uh, time for, for generating the, the ordering, the partitioners. And what these are are three different separator codes. This is Metis. I don't know if any of you have heard of Metis. It's the most popular graph separator code out there. It's very, very widely used, especially in the scientific commu uh, computing community. We use that. That's pretty expensive. I guess that's what that 153. Then we use some sort of uh, much faster versions of separators, which didn't quite do as well in general, uh, in some, although in some cases they did better. And, but they gave perfectly reasonable compression. These number here are bits per edge. Okay, so uh, these are actually some uh, basically uh, uh, graphs from scientific computing up here. These are maps. This is a Pennsylvania street map, the California street map. These are small samples of Google, uh, of a Google a web graph that we got from Google a while ago. And uh, this is, here is the number of bits per edge. So what it says is we can basically take, and the Google line Google is the, uh, basically it's a directed graph. So this is the in edges and the out edges. It turns out that uh, because you can have, have many more in edges and out edges, it's actually more in efficient to represent the in edges than the out edges. Um, because the degree, the out degree is not very high, but the in degree can be very high. Um, so that's the number of bits per edge to, to encode it using our most efficient. So you can see it's only four, six. And now in practice, what we typically do is we always round up to a byte. So we always store, use at least one byte. So if this would be at least uh, you know, eight bits. But the point is we get down an edge down to about one byte. So if you now want to do a, a back of the envelope calculation of how big of a graph you can fit in your memory, okay. Again, you might have auxiliary data, calculate that separate and add it on. But just for the graph, the edge and vertex construct, and you just want to ask yourself, how big of a graph can I fit in my memory? A rough rule, and you're going to use compression, a rough rule of thumb will be one byte per edge. Okay, so if you have a billion edges, that'll figure, figure in a bit, fit in a gigabyte and could it fit on your laptop. Okay, if you have 10 billion edges, uh, then you will maybe be able to have a lot of memory in your laptop, but uh, beyond that, it's <coughs> going to be tough. <coughs> anyway, so, there are these graph compression techniques. They apply to different sorts of graphs. They're not specific to just web graphs. They apply to these are scientific computing, map graphs, web graphs. This is a Lucent. This is a graph of the uh, uh, routers, the wires between routers on Lucent. So that's some, uh, <coughs> and I forget what the scan graph is here. Um, okay, so um, I guess the conclusion is for <coughs> many applications of large data, uh, the maybe your, it will fit in memory. And I'm not going to pr uh, promise you it always fits in memory, but I, I think it's at least worth making a back of the envelope calculation. Take the ed number of edges in your graph, you know, do, do the calculation, uh, you know, maybe decide whether you're willing to uh, write the compression code or not. Uh, and, you know, there's a factor of 10 to 1 between those, but you can sort of calculate what's going to fit. <coughs> um, and then the argument is that once it, if it does fit into shared memory, there's, there is a, a big programming advantage, which is you don't have to make these special purpose libraries. You have a general purpose programming model where you can mix, you can create complicated uh, pointer structures, trees and graphs and mixes of them. You can have nested parallelism, you can have pipeline parallelism, all these things. Uh, <coughs> the code is typically simple and more general. Uh, you know, a lot of the, these high-level libraries like MapReduce they, they're actually very simple also because they're limited, okay? But under the hood, uh, they're very complicated. So maybe this is, uh, I should say, if you want to do write really optimized code, it's going to be simple and more general. Um, and probably if you wanted to just calculate what's the most energy efficient way to do these graph calculations, uh, and uh, time mattered was secondary, you'd probably figure out one of these disk-based algorithms is the most efficient. Okay, so maybe it's 30 times slower, and maybe you're not willing to put up with that. But if you are, you've got this, you could do it on a laptop that, you know, you can run on a battery. Uh, you know, you probably, the however many, uh, the a few hours it takes to run, maybe you'll run out of your battery because it's running at 100 peak. But, uh, <coughs> you know, you, it's not going to take that much uh, electricity. So, uh, but, you know, often you want results faster, and then you might want to go up to uh, a somewhat more powerful system. Okay, so that's all I was going to say. Mm -hmm.